Chapter Twenty Three of Miss D. Dunmore Bryant by Pansy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Three. Who knows? I may as well finish them up," she had said cheerfully, "and be done with it. Who knows what may happen, or how soon some of them may be needed?" This she had said three days before but on the morning of which i write when that tear i told you of had rolled off her nose times looked dark it was raining outside perhaps that may have been one reason and dory the scapegrace had not brought home one cent the night before though he admitted that he had sold two newspapers but he had lent the money to another fellow who had bought two glasses of soda and two buns with it and treated miss perkins tried to be glad that the treat was soda water instead of anything more dangerous and i am almost glad that she did not know how dangerous a drink soda water even can be made because i really think she had trouble enough well she sewed on her dolly's head and looked soberly at it and presently plashed a tear right into the middle of its unwinking eye and wondered whether it was worth while to try to finish up these dolls who would ever buy them she was sure she didn't know and she actually forgot that there was one who did at precisely that moment of time miss webster in her room two hundred miles away having been waited upon by her nurse to writing pad and writing rest and stylographic pen was writing a letter which read like this my dear miss perkins i hope you have what i need or can get them ready in the course of the next few weeks i want about thirty dollies not fine ones just neat plain little creatures well made as i know all your work is there is to be a dolly's fair in this town in the course of the next two weeks and if i can get the dolls within a week i think i have a plan by which they can all be dressed in time for the fair I enclose my check for thirty-five dollars, for which please send me, if you possibly can, thirty of the best-looking misses. They need not all be worth a dollar apiece. Indeed, I do not care if some are very small and cheap, but some of them will probably be worth much more than that. At least I want only thirty, and I am willing to pay that price for them. The extra five dollars will cover the packing and expressage, I think please let me know by return mail whether you can accommodate me i hope you are having a pleasant spring and that dory has not forgotten that he is going to try to grow up a man what do you think miss perkins will say when she receives that letter will she remember those tears do you suppose that she shed while it was being written and the gloomy almost despairing thoughts she had so fast miss perkins you will have no time to waste in tears miss webster is already sealing and addressing her letter the postman's whistle is sounding on the street below he will hurry it into his mailbag the clerk at the post office will presently push it with all speed into the right bag and the train will rattle it over the rails miles and miles and other clerks will glance at it and push it on and a postman will presently ring at your own door, and you will be sure that he can have nothing for you, as there is nobody to write to you now, and you will be sure, while you are breaking the seal, that there is some mistake. But there is no mistake. The loving father who lets not a sparrow fall to the ground without his care, and who numbers the very hairs of your head, has planned it all. Brush away the tears, smile and trust, and so fast miss perkins for the dollies are needed by this time you feel sure that benjamin bryant must have reached home if you could have heard his sister line ask questions in an eager effort to get him to describe the scenes through which he had just passed you would have been sure of it did mrs dunmore sit down to the table with you just you three how queer ben how did she look i mean how was she dressed how do i know she had on some clothes of course and a little three-cornered patch on top of her head i thought she would have looked better without that i felt afraid it would slip off all the time it looked loose and flapped a little in the wind 
a three-cornered patch i suppose it was one of those lovely lace breakfast caps what color was her dress ben blue i guess or i don't know a kind of gray a greenish gray with blue ribbons to tie it up with they fluttered around in the way she didn't look as nice as mother does of course not you silly boy nobody ever looks as nice as mothers do but i don't believe her dress was greenish with blue ribbons that would be in horrid taste it was some of those colors said ben confidently then mother do you know barnum's circus was coming next week the handbills are all over town great big pictures of all sorts of terrible looking animals i should like to see the animals oh never mind the old circus tell us all about the breakfast we have never been to a style breakfast you know this from line of course why i have told you we had things to eat and we ate them beefsteak and things and they were good mother did you ever see anything like a boy for describing things if it had been daisy or me we should have had a whole book full to tell and here is this provoking boy can only say he had things to eat well said ben laughing what would you have we had butter and muffins and coffee or they had and milk iced milk and sauce sauce for breakfast yes'm sauce for breakfast a large dish of it and it was good and mush of some kind they had the first thing with cream on it not milk but thick cream you could almost cut it it was so thick that was oatmeal said line with a superior air people eat oatmeal and cream first nowadays real stylish people do it would seem queer to me like having bread and milk for breakfast go on ben there's nothing to go on about i've told you everything now anyhow oh no you haven't how was the table arranged what kind of dishes and where were they put put repeated ben helplessly why on the table of course and they were dishes like anybody's only some of them were silver and others were blue and all colors oh dear me said line was there ever anybody like a boy whereupon both mrs bryant and daisy laughed you haven't studied the art of description have you ben his mother said pleasantly never mind caroline boys never do observe in those directions as carefully as girls or at least they rarely do did you have a comfortable time my son all things considered part of the time i did and part of the time i didn't i spilled my glass of milk an exclamation of dismay from line a look of sympathetic pity from daisy and the mother asked on the table how did that happen yes'm on the tablecloth and it was as heavy as as a comfortable i don't know how they contrived to have their tablecloths so heavy you couldn't feel the table under it any more than if it had been a cushion i don't know how it happened i am sure i was being just as careful as a fellow ever was and the first thing over it went what did you do asked line i should have wanted to sink right through the floor i know i should it wouldn't have done you any good if you had wanted to ben said coolly the floor is all hard wood without any holes in it and polished until it shines like glass and feels almost as slippery and they have great squares of carpet lying around on it so thick that you don't hear your own feet at all when you step on them but they don't sink in enough to put a fellow out of sight i didn't do anything only blush and stammer but it was all cleared up in about a minute the black man whisked out a cloth from somewhere and mopped it up and spread a great beautiful white sheet over the wet place and mrs dunmore acted as though she hadn't seen it at all she leaned over and handed me a rose and asked me if i knew what the name of that variety was it happened that i did too and could tell her all about it miss webster showed me some like them last week and judge dunmore said that reminds me of when i was a boy about your age and then he told the funniest story about an accident that happened to him 
it is too long to tell now i've got to go mr holden will be waiting for me that reminds me of the circus again mother if people had money to spare so that it would not be taking it from things that they needed could there be anything very dreadful in going to a circus just to see the animals what a boy said line he keeps flying off to a circus every few minutes when he has just been to breakfast with a judge mrs bryant smiled i think that will be a longer story than the one you had not time for she said suppose we leave it until evening especially added line since you are not the boy with money to spare and you are not likely to be there are such boys added ben gravely rufus wants to go dreadfully and i shouldn't be surprised if he should manage it somehow rufus i shouldn't think he could spare the money much better than we mrs kedwin told me yesterday that she did not know what they were going to do that she would close the season in debt in spite of all her efforts she says if miss webster did not pay as much again for her board as it was worth she should be just swamped in debt that is the very word she used if i were rufus i should be ashamed to talk about spending money at a circus when my mother was almost beside herself trying to pay her bills i'm ashamed of rufus almost every time i see him or hear anything from him i think he grows worse instead of better i'm afraid he does said ben looking grave and wondering what line would think if she knew he had tried to borrow money for the circus he has got intimate with a set of boys who make him worse than he would be he goes with that jonas smith a good deal and they read books together that are not what you and mother would think very good i guess rufus used to like mr holden don't you remember when he said he was a splendid man now he doesn't like to hear his name he is always saying that he meddles with other people's business the mention of that name again seemed to remind ben that he was in haste and he started up suddenly turning back as he reached the door to say with a flush on his face as though it was a bit of news of which he was half ashamed something else happened this morning that i didn't tell you about judge dunmore took me into his library and gave me letters to write business letters you know he had written on slips of paper about what he wanted said and i had to put them into shape i wrote four and he paid me twenty-five cents and i am to come every morning this week and perhaps longer why ben said his mother in a gratified voice and line set down the cup she was rinsing very suddenly and rushed over to him dish towel in hand to give him a hearty hug and kiss what a boy she exclaimed for the third time that morning tell all about carpets flowers circuses and i don't know what else and leave such a splendid piece of news to the last second ben it is the beginning of the fortune you are going to make out of that machine why didn't you tell before hadn't a chance said ben relishing his importance highly but trying to look dignified and manly you wanted to know all about dishes and clothes and things and didn't ask a word about the machine so i tried to please you besides it isn't much i suppose rufus says it isn't he says judge dunmore will be going away in a few weeks which is true enough and that then there will be no more work for the machine he says i ought to be paid more than twenty-five cents for writing four letters that it is ridiculous in judge dunmore to get his work done for next to nothing rufus is an ignorant boy whose opinions are not to be noticed said mrs bryant with more haste than she usually spoke if i thought that such talk as that had the least influence over you i should not want you to go with rufus kedwin my son ben laughed good-humouredly i'm not going to quarrel with my quarters mother because they are not half dollars if that is what you mean rufus always lost any chances there were for him by being disgusted because they were not bigger where is daisy gone over to miss webster's to plan about the fair her mind is so full of it that she cannot sleep nights 
i shall be almost glad when it is over she says mr holden has sent for a dolly who is to come by express and have the place of honor he hopes at the fair he must be an unusual minister to interest himself in a child's fair when she is almost a stranger to him and not of his congregation he is an unusual minister said ben and he is being kept waiting unusually long good-bye mother and he vanished half an hour afterwards he was writing names on envelopes with neatness and speed certain circulars which the minister desired to have go out in the next mail were being prepared so ben had agreed to come in the morning instead of the afternoon he worked on silently for some time steadily lowering the pile of envelopes until now only a half dozen were left of those which must soon go and the minister who had laid down his pen which had been racing over the paper ran his fingers through his hair in a way he had when he wanted to rest his brain looked over at ben and smiled well sir he said cheerily my morning's stint is accomplished how is it with yours almost done sir could you be asked a question now half a dozen of them if you will what's the harm in circuses the minister looked neither shocked nor surprised only reflective after a moment's silence is there harm in them my boy ben looked up astonished why i thought so he said slowly at least i thought you thought so why should i why because you are a minister do all ministers think so i suppose so why do they that is what i am asking you ben said with a gleam of fun in his handsome eyes the minister answered the look with a genial laugh and you think i am begging the question he said i do not mean to i only wanted to get a glimpse of the reasoning processes through which you have been you seem to have come to conclusions in regard to a certain class of workers called ministers are they the only ones included in this position which you say they take and mothers said ben slowly ah mothers they are of us are they a very respectable portion of the world don't you think whose opinions ought to carry weight yes sir and for that reason i'm trying to find out why they hold them what does your mother say she has never said much only she didn't take us when we were younger and she could and i know she wouldn't want us to go if we could she is going to talk it over to-night i think i'll wait until after to-night before i make a full answer the minister said smiling i am a believer in mothers in the meantime i will ask you two or three questions what effect should you suppose it would have on a boy of about your age to give up all regular work and regular study and go travelling about the country taking care of monkeys we will say or bears stopping at one place to-day at another to-morrow and so on having no home life or home associations spending his sundays in travel or in getting ready to exhibit his monkeys or bears i should think it would have a very bad effect indeed suppose added to the surroundings i have mentioned there should be men much older than he who had been demoralized by such living and had learned to swear and to drink and to gamble and spent much of their leisure in this manner suppose that the boy of about your age had chiefly to do with such men did not stay long enough in any one place to form other acquaintances or to be influenced by other lives than these suppose that the few women whom he knew were of the sort who tolerated at least perhaps enjoyed the society of men such as i have described and were more or less like them i should think it would be horrid sir then i will ask you only one question more what is the harm in circuses ben's cheeks glowed and he glanced up with a half laugh then after a moment of silence during which he addressed the last envelope in the pile he said but going to see the monkeys and the bears for one evening wouldn't hurt the boy who was travelling with them 
but he wouldn't travel with them if i and my brother and sister didn't pay him money for showing them other people will said ben in a low tone as though half ashamed of the words am i my brother's keeper said the minister ben sealed the last letter stamped it placed it in a neat package ready for the office then arose package in hand and a thoughtful look on his face thank you he said for what asked mr holden rising ben my dear fellow one question more i have said nothing about it for quite a while but it hasn't been because i am not deeply interested in the answer have you settled that other matter fully ben's eyes were fixed on the questioner's face and his smile was full and sweet yes sir he said promptly i have the minister held out his hand then my dear boy i may claim you as a young brother in jesus christ a soldier who has enlisted for life under my captain yes sir if i understand myself and i think i do i belong to him for life god bless you my dear young brother does mother know i haven't told her yet said ben his cheeks flushing but i mean to i have told nobody but little daisy End of chapter twenty three Chapter Twenty Four of Miss D. Dunmore Bryant by Pansy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Four A Happy Mother. Nothing ever worked up better than that fair. Miss Perkins was ready with her thirty dollies, and you and I can imagine just how she felt when the order came which swept nearly all her stock on hand away, but left instead money enough to support dory and herself for the next three months but she was by no means the only one who planned dolls for that fair on the very evening in which the order from miss webster arrived came one of the college girls to call on miss perkins just a little bit of red kid no larger than her two fingers was what she thought she came after but in reality she came to hear miss perkins pour out her joy over the large order to hear the letter read which explained why they were wanted and to clap her hands gleefully and say that's the very thing for us the children in our circle have been dressing dolls to give away we planned it for them to teach them how to sew we'll send them to this fair the dolls you know not the children and let them be sold for the benefit of whatever the managers are working for it is sure to be a good object if miss webster is interested in it i mean to write to her this very evening won't that be nice miss perkins some of the dolls are the oddest looking creatures you ever saw we girls in the graduating class have each planned a dolly like the one we used to love the best when we were little dots and some of them are unique in this way and in many other ways of which i have not time to tell you the interest grew by the time miss perkins's box arrived the young ladies of mr holden's church had formed a circle to meet on two consecutive afternoons and dress dolls for miss webster's fair every one of them knew miss webster and were ready to serve her a few of them were acquainted with little daisy and understood something about the occasion for this effort from judge dunmore's home went great packages made up of bits of lace and silk and velvet such as would have delighted any dolly's heart mrs irving the married daughter said she wondered when she packed her trunks why all those cast-off bits of finery persisted in coming along and now she knew cards of invitation were already sent out in the name of miss d dunmore bryant inviting every dolly in town to exhibit herself at the fair and judge dunmore offered a prize of a five dollar gold piece to be given to the most neatly and tastefully dressed dolly three ladies none of whom had ever seen any of the dollies until the afternoon of the fair to be chosen as committee of award 
Miss Webster was hard at work making and dressing an exact representation of Sally, the famous doll who lived in the White House in the years when John Adams was President of the United States, and Mary Louisa was his little daughter. The day before the fair was one long excitement to Daisy Bryant. Surprises began as early as seven o'clock in the morning, when that express package arrived from the college girls, a good-sized box filled with dolls, which Daisy would certainly have called unique, had she been acquainted with the word. Among other wonders in this box was a remarkable shoe made of pasteboard covered with velvet, and filled even to overflowing with dolls. I may as well tell you in passing that this shoe full of dolls was the cause of great discomfort to Daisy. One little visitor, from whom she had hoped much, sat down disconsolate before this shoe, refusing to be interested in anything, making herself and all about her miserable because her mother refused to buy the entire family, old woman, shoe, and all. In vain, Daisy gently explained, I couldn't spare them all to one customer, Alice, dear. I couldn't, really. There are a great many people here, you know, and so many of them want dollies that I think I shall have to take orders from some and supply them afterwards. So you see, it would not do for one little girl to buy so many. The only answer the broken-hearted Alice had to all this was a twitch of the shoulders and a snarly little, Go away, do! What difference would it make to you whether other people get dollies or not if you sold them all? I want the old woman in her shoe and all her children, or else I don't want any doll at all. So Daisy turned away with a sigh to attend to some less exacting customer. She found it hard to understand such a form of selfishness as this. Little girls were certainly not all alike, but Daisy had had her trials. On the afternoon before the fair, when Miss Webster was wheeled into the front room upstairs where the dolls were to be exhibited, she found Daisy alone on her knees in front of a beautiful wax miss who had arrived from Boston but the night before, and was by far the most beautiful doll on which Daisy's eyes had ever rested. It was from Miss Webster's brother Ben, who sent his love to Daisy and his hearty regards to his namesake, Benjamin Bryant. Even Miss Webster had been surprised at this, and had laughed until the tears were in her eyes, and she had bent over and kissed the doll to hide them, as she said, Dear boy, who would have supposed that he would think to do such a thing? Yet, after all, I do not know why I should be surprised. It is just like him. In front of this dolly, as I said, knelt Daisy, alone but for the presence of Bobby, a boarder's baby, who had been left in her care for ten minutes while his mother ran downstairs on an errand. Bobby was comfortable in his basket, but was at that moment very much astonished because Daisy did not look around and attend to him, as he had just thrown his rubber ball at her head to attract her notice. To be sure, it had missed aim and only bounded lightly against her dress, but Bobby thought she might have noticed it. The truth was, she was too much absorbed. She did not even hear the soft roll of Miss Webster's chair, and did not look around until that lady said gently, Is she talking to you, Daisy, or are you just loving her? Then Daisy gave one of those slow, long, drawn-out sighs, which seemed to come somewhere from the depths of her heart, and said gravely, very gravely indeed, Miss Webster, I shall make her a tenth. Shall you indeed? said Miss Webster, with a slight start. I confess I am surprised at that. She would bring you in quite a sum of money, Daisy, dear. I know it, ma'am, said Daisy firmly, but I have quite made up my mind that she shall be a tenth. Because, Miss Webster, and here a lovely flush spread over Daisy's face, at first I didn't want to do it. I don't understand why, but I didn't, really. I think I wanted to keep her for myself. 
it seemed to me that i couldn't bear to sell her or even give her away it is very strange that i should have such a naughty feeling and then to miss webster's dismay the slow tears came dropping softly from daisy's eyes my darling she said soothingly i do not think it at all strange that you should want to keep such a lovely little dolly for yourself especially when it was sent on purpose for you by my brother why should you not keep it there will be a great many others on exhibition and she might have the same position then after the fair you could keep her for your own i'm sure my brother ben would like that daisy turned toward her now the tears brushed away her eyes large and sorrowful fixed on miss webster in a sort of sad surprise it wouldn't be right she said gravely i do not need her it isn't as it was when my dear d dunmore came she was only for me and for nothing else and i was never to part with her but this one your brother said was for me to do what i thought best with and of course i ought to think best to give it to jesus for it is the very loveliest one i ever had and i always wanted to give the best before i do not understand why i feel so tears were very near the surface again miss webster made haste to argue the point daisy my darling do you think she would be an entirely suitable tenth of course the home where you would send the dolly in that way would be a poor little house and would not such an elegant dolly be out of place and not feel as much at home as a plainer and more simply dressed one would daisy slowly shook her head she cannot feel you know miss webster i have to keep remembering that all the time or else i could not sell them nor give them away nor anything so even if things are not comfortable she will not mind and the little girl is sure to love beautiful things almost more i think sometimes because she is poor and hasn't anything very pretty of her own and beside miss webster jesus left heaven you know and came down here and was poor and hadn't even where to lay his head miss webster was utterly silent and there was such a mist in her eyes she could hardly see the little face which had turned again to the beautiful dolly and with folded hands and fixed gaze was studying it before this miss webster had bowed to and motioned in mr holden who had appeared at the open door his eyes danced with mirth at first then softened into something very like reverence as he listened to this unusual reasoning from a child he came over presently to where daisy knelt and dropped on one knee beside her do not be troubled daisy dear he said we often find it hard to give our best while we are here and cannot see him plainly but he is so good that he accepts the gift and loves the giver even though she has little quivers of wanting to keep her treasures for herself one of these days you and i will have learned to love him so much that we shall be only glad to give everything to him daisy turned toward him smiling gently i thank you she said with sweet gravity whereupon she gave instant attention to bobby who thought he had been silent and unnoticed long enough that is very strong meat richard miss webster said smiling as she too brushed away a tear i know it but the child is an unusual one and i'm sure i hope you know what those two grown-up people meant there was certainly no meat in the room so daisy you see knew something about selfish qualms though the little alice's form of it did not touch her she had another talk with miss webster about the beautiful dolly i have quite decided she said taking neat last stitches in the long white dress she was making i wonder that i could have wanted to keep it there was one thing i did not think of at first as soon as i did all the want to went away i should not have minded for d's sake because she is pretty enough but there is my poor arabella aurelia might have been hurt i would not have her feelings hurt for anything in the world 
and if i had thought of that in the first place there would not have been any hard to it miss webster waited a moment to steady her voice so there should be no hint of a laugh in it before she said i understand but i wonder that that thought did not trouble you when d dunmore came that was different said daisy with decision d was my very own from the first minute there was never anything to decide but here there was then after a moment's pause do you think miss webster that arabella aurelia would like better to wear a sash or just to be in plain white from head to root i really do not feel equal to deciding that question said miss webster gravely your plans for arabella aurelia have been so entirely unlike what i supposed they would be that i believe you are the best judge daisy turned on her somewhat anxious eyes do you mean that you are not sure about her liking it she asked with gentle gravity you see she is so different from any of the others without any arms or feet or even nose that i thought if i dressed her in just white with everything as clean and neat as i could make it and took every stitch myself she would like it i have let line and the young ladies help with all the others even my dear d line made a hat for and looped her dress but nobody has touched my poor arabella aurelia's things but myself was there ever a smaller and sweeter picture of the sublimity of mother love poor little deformed wooden arabella aurelia without even a nose to receive patient and unremitting care while the beautiful d had her adornments furnished by other hands i never know whether to laugh or cry said miss webster when you get to asking me questions and she contented herself with kissing the little mother rapturously and so the fair took place and was in all respects a most remarkable success if you could have seen the dollies of every grade which swarmed in the rooms you would have been sure of it it was also very largely attended all the afternoon and evening the rooms were thronged and to daisy's great astonishment mrs dunmore sent cake and cream to be served to each caller do they do that at fairs she had asked ben with wide-open pleased eyes it was certainly a very pleasant thing to do but she went to a fair once and felt sure it was omitted then not commonly said ben trying not to laugh this is in some respects an uncommon occasion before the day was over daisy felt sure he was right another surprise awaited her the committee of award after sitting apart in solemn session for nearly an hour notebooks in hand earnestly discussing the merits of the different wax and wooden ladies under their charge brought in a unanimous report which nearly took daisy's breath away behold of all the elegant boston new york and even parisian beauties who had adorned the grand stand arabella aurelia had been singled out as the one to take the prize it is not that there are not more elegantly dressed dolls explained the sweet-voiced lady who had acted as chairman of the committee or more beautiful ones as regards form and features but your committee understood that nothing of this kind was to be taken into consideration the giver of the prize expressly stipulated that it should be presented to the dolly who was the most appropriately and the most carefully dressed as regarded small details keeping these instructions in mind we have no hesitancy in saying that miss arabella aurelia beyond all question has won the prize her dress is not only exquisitely appropriate to early childhood but every article upon her is made with the most painstaking neatness every stitch has apparently been set with a view to being as nearly right as possible other dollies upon whom much less care has been bestowed have failed when it came to an examination of the buttonholes those on arabella aurelia's wardrobe would do credit to a tailor still other children 
looking very well on the surface have been basted together or pins have been made to serve where needle and thread are generally used nothing of this kind appears about arabella aurelia in short she is in most perfect and careful order from head to foot and in the estimation of your committee the mere accident of her not possessing arms or hands or even a nose had nothing to do with the qualifications to be considered in awarding the prize we therefore do unanimously vote that the five dollar gold piece be hung about the neck of arabella aurelia bryant great was the delight of the company over this happy result they could not be restrained from breaking into a general clapping of hands and one venturesome boy even hinted at the propriety of giving arabella aurelia three cheers but he was promptly silenced for mr holden had mounted a chair and was thanking the committee in the name of that young lady and the people generally in the name of miss d dunmore bryant for their cordial and substantial patronage it seemed for a time as though the bryant family would not get to rest that night even after they had torn themselves away from miss webster's rooms and were at home they were too much excited and too eager all to talk at once to think of going to bed what a wonderful time it had been how many people had come whom they had had no idea of seeing what a triumph for arabella aurelia how funny it was for mr holden to buy sally and to think that he should pay four dollars for her what an almost alarming amount of money had been made actually fifty seven dollars and forty three cents in daisy's strong little safe to say nothing of the five dollar gold piece at this moment suspended by a white ribbon from arabella aurelia's neck it is well you have a neck my lady ben had said if you haven't any nose and fanny kedwin standing beside him watching while he fastened the ribbon said i told daisy i thought it was silly for her to take so much pains with those buttonholes but it seems it paid it nearly always pays to take pains with things said that young man sagely and he thought within himself how much alike fanny and rufus kedwin were beside the fifty-seven dollars there were twenty-four new dollies left in stock where had all the money come from nobody seemed to know is it any wonder that they were excited mrs bryant did get daisy tucked away at last with arabella aurelia beside her and line went to see that all was as it should be in the store leaving ben and his mother alone for a moment in the little kitchen it has been a great success hasn't it my boy the mother said splendid said ben i have been so busy helping to get ready and then seeing it through that i haven't had a chance to tell you something i've got regular work judge dunmore recommended me to that mr welford who has an office on main street he is a lawyer you know and it seems he wants copying done and letters written and things of that kind regularly and i'm to go there afternoons after this as long as i suit he said and mornings i can have through the summer for extra pieces of work which he says he can find me and by fall he thinks i can keep my place in the office and go to school to recite judge dunmore says mr welford will pay me a good fair price for my work as much as i could earn anywhere what do you think of that i think it is just splendid said mrs bryant heartily i always knew my children would make a way out of my perplexities for me but i did not think they could do it so effectually so soon what with your and lines and daisy's faithful help we really begin to see daylight and i believe with all my heart ben that the education for all of you will come i like the school part almost better than any of it i believe so do i said ben heartily that means line two you know we'll start in together when we start and mother there's one thing more i promised myself i would tell you before i slept again though i don't exactly know how 
the mother turned on him a tender yet anxious look and spoke quickly what is it my boy have you gotten into any trouble or done something you don't quite like don't be afraid to tell mother ben laughed a little at that though his face sobered instantly no mother it is no trouble it is good only i don't quite know how to tell such things i've become a soldier enlisted for life mr holden calls it and the lord jesus christ is my captain i thought you would like to know then that mother folded both arms about her boy and kissed his cheeks his forehead his lips and there was such a light in her eyes as he will never forget my dear dear boy she said no other news that you can ever give me will be half so grand as this now indeed mother's heart is at rest end of chapter twenty four end of miss d dunmore bryant by pansy recorded by tricia g thanks for listening